around here, and we'll start with we'll start with this here, the Frankfurt Assembly. And the Frankfurt Assembly, hopefully you remember, is part of the revolutions of 1848. And in 1848, remember, there's no Germany in 1848. And I hopefully remember talking about this when we were speaking of these revolutions, that for most of history, there's no Germany, right? Germany is essentially a connection of thir a collection of 30 some odd separate states. And when I say states, I use that term in this presentation interchangeably with countries. They're essentially self-governing for the most part. Um, and so there's just several German speaking countries. And remember, nationalism is perhaps the most persuasive of all the isms that we talk about and it's it it spread by Napoleon I and his conquest through Europe, this idea that your country is number one and you should prove it on every stage possible, drives the German-speaking people of all these separate German states to want to come together to form a united and powerful Germany. So using lib liberal principles in the revolution of 1848, Delegates are selected, are voted in to what's called the Frankfurt Assembly, and the Frankfurt Assembly comes together to try to create a constitution that will unite all these German states. And hopefully you remember that they they create this document, they offer the crown of Germany um, to Frederick Wilhelm, the king of Prussia at the time, and he rejects it, and he rejects it in a fairly insulting way. He says, the crown on my head comes from hundreds of years of my ancestors ruling over Prussia, and the crown comes from God. And he says, essentially, to compare that crown with a crown offered by a bunch of people who got there because they were voted in by the masses um, would, is, is silly. So he, he rejects it. The Frankfurt Assembly is a failure. Germany remains divided, and overall, it's this idea of liberalism that is seen as failing uh, to unite and strengthen Germany. And so when Bismarck comes along, he is going to appeal to German nationalism and use authoritarianism to unite Germany. And this, combined with militarism, is what makes him ultimately successful, not liberalism. Um, and this is a lesson that he takes uh, from Napoleon III and other European leaders that essentially... People love nationalism. People love the military. And when you put those two things together and compare them with freedom and equality and voting, um, the nationalism and the militarism perhaps, sadly, wins out. So also, in all these German states, you have two that are particularly strong. Prussia, and that's who's going to end up leading this drive for unification. Uh, Prussia is in northern Germany, um, fairly industrialized, uh, known for their strong military. Prussia is one of two armies that, that defeat Napoleon I at the Battle of, Battle of Waterloo. And then you have Austria, sort of the old school leader of German-speaking states. Austria, um, part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, ruled over by the Habsburgs, who at one point um, have kings or emperors on nearly all the thrones of Western Europe. Traditionally, Austria had been the strongest. Austria still sees themselves as strongest, but they're not going to be. And in the end, they're going to lose this diplomatic and military battle to the Prussians, who will unite Germany around them. Uh, liberalism is used by Prussia economically. One thing that you want to remember about your classical liberals is your classical liberals kind of like your conservatives of today or your Republicans in America of today were very interested in lowering taxes on the middle class and getting the government out of trade. And this word, laissez-faire, translates into hands off. And to promote laissez-faire policies means that the government takes its hands off of the economy or of businesses and trade. And Prussia creates a laissez-faire northern trade alliance. And all that means is that they create an alliance, they lead an alliance of the northern states in Germany that agree to no longer tax items as they travel from across a border between one state and another. And Germany is in interspersed with many rivers which are predominantly used to transport goods by traders. And what this northern trade alliance does by getting rid of the taxes to transport goods is it inspires people to trade more. And as people trade more and the businesses make more money, ultimately that makes more available money to the government or more money available to the governments um, in, in the form of taxes, which allows 
asked the government to, to lead a militarization, particularly in the case of Prussia. So this Northern Trade Alliance, it allows businesses to get richer, it allows countries to get richer, and in this particular case, um, it is a good example of how government not regulating trade benefits lots of people. Um, we're seeing the opposite of that, arguably, at this point, with the deregulation of trade causing a massive consolidation of wealth in our current world among the top 1%. But here is the other side of the story in the unification of Germany, where these laissez-faire practices seem to work uh, for most people. Okay, here is our spectacular facial hair. Um, and I offer an extra credit to all the guys in class. If they can actually grow out a beard that looks like this, you can get a few extra credit points. And just so we're not totally sexist for you ladies out there, if you can create a makeup or costume prop beard that you only have to wear for the duration of one period, you can also get extra credit points. Um, so once again, we have King William, also known as King Wilhelm of Prussia, with the greatest facial hair in history. Now. Wilhelm, I hope you can see by his spiffy uniform littered with medals, must have been heavy to walk around in that. Wilhelm, above and beyond the other, his other ideals, is militarism. And militarism is birthed, arguably, in my opinion, through this unification of, Germ uh, of Germany process. I mean, you, sure, it exists before, you know, to be part of the, the French National Army and the area of Napoleon was certainly, uh, certainly lauded and something to be proud of. But this idea that the military is the greatest part of a country really comes through to the people because of the deeds of Wilhelm I and his henchman, Otto von Bismarck. And militarism is something that we, we really almost just take for granted today. Even in our, our multicultural classrooms at MCI, it doesn't matter if a student is from America or from China um, or from Russia or, or from or from the Ukraine, everybody's proud of their military. You just, you can't be politically correct and get up in front of a group of people and bash on the military, which is, is perhaps tragic considering the results of this. Um, but nonetheless, you know, if you've been to an air show um, and oohed and ah and felt the thunder of jets approaching supersonic speeds as they fly over your heads and thought, yay America, or, you know, yay Russia, or yay China, um, you've experienced militarism. Um, and, and this uh, this is a, almost an addictive rush for the populations of these countries. You take militarism, right, and you combine it uh, with its brother nationalism and with industrialization, and you have lots of people who are super proud of their armies, which are armed to the teeth with hundreds of thousands of weapons, who would really like to show the value of their country through warfare. Um, and while this works very well for Prussia and uniting Germany because their army is so much more advanced than all the other countries that they fight against. This idea of militarism and industrialized armies and nationalism creates a global catastrophe, or at least a European catastrophe, in World War I, which we'll get to a little bit later. So anyway, Wilhelm I, he wants to double the size of his army. He wants to professionalize his army. He wants his army to be the greatest in Europe. And if you look at a, at a map of, of Germany at this time where the German states essentially, you know, you got Prussia here, you know, you got all these little German states all around, you got, you got uh, Denmark up here, and then you got Russia, Austria, and then you got France over here, a little Belgium up here, but mainly you got France and you got Russia um, right on either side of, of Prussia and of the other side of these German states. And Wilhelm makes the point that France particularly militaristic and ambitious in the past, you know, Napoleon I, Russia, uh, militarizing their country currently, and he says, poor little Prussia is caught in the middle. Um, whereas if you're France, you know, you got water here, you got water here, you got a bunch of mountains here, you don't have to worry so much, and if you're Russia, you only really got the one border, because the Chinese are unlikely to attack, you know, way over there in the east, and you got, you know, essentially Antarctica up top. And so, uh, Wilhelm makes this argument to his legislature that they desperately need to modernize their army and double its size and professionalize it. Um, and in order to do this, of course, you must raise taxes. And so Wilhelm goes to his legislature because constitutionally he is supposed to ask and get approval from them before he raises taxes. And despite um, his impassioned speech, his glorious militarism and nationalism, his Congress says,
No. So he appoints Otto von Bismarck to get the job done. Von Bismarck, you know, great mustache, not quite up to par with Wilhelm, but very fancy helmet. Um, if you lose your gun in battle and your bayonet breaks, you can simply lean forward and charge crazily at your enemy and strike fear in them with your giant spike on your helmet. Uh, Otto von Bismarck, perhaps the most brilliant known politician in the middle of the 1800s. And he, he espouses, as we, said for, as, as we said before, this idea of real politics. Also, if you see it in books spelled real politic. Okay. The politics of reality. And Bismarck, essentially, if he's in front of liberals, he tries to lean towards liberalism. If he's in front of conservatives, he tries to lean more court towards conservatism. But he knows, above and beyond all else, the way to sell an idea is nationalism. So, Bismarck, in his youth... You know, just to give you a little background on this guy, he's born um, into a noble military class called the Junker class in Prussia. His mother wants him to go to the university, which he does, you know, perhaps somewhat begr begrudgingly because what he's known best for at university is, is partying and womanizing. Um, the only class he has any particular interest in is the economics of politics. Um, so pretty much he doesn't learn a heck of a lot at the university initially, except that he loves women, he loves to drink, and then apparently he meets the love of his life. Uh, and he gets married, and this woman is also a Lutheran. And this is important because Bismarck has a religious conversion as he meets this woman. He sees the light, perhaps. And f for Lutherans um, and many other Protestants, you have something called the Protestant work ethic. The Protestant work, work ethic is it's essentially the idea, and, and birth by the revolutions of Martin Luther and John Calvin that follow him, and really championed by John Calvin and the Calvinists and exported to America. Essentially, it boils down to the fact that if you, are, if you want to prove to everybody else that you're one of God's chosen few selected for heaven at birth, the best way to do that is to show everybody your success in life. And the best way to show folks your success in life is to show folks your success in business and work. And essentially, the Protestant work ethic, and this is something I believe um, championed by Max Weber, a uh, German sociologist, uh, the Protestant work ethic is what drives uh, Westerners, and in particular Americans, to just love to work for 60 hours a week so they can have that four hours on Saturday in between doing chores and then going to church um, to spend their money um, and, and enjoy their time with their family. And for Bismarck, the Protestant work ethic is important because it it pushes him, arguably, to switch from his life and career of womanizing and partying to dedicating himself to becoming a successful politician. And through the diplomatic ranks of Prussia, he works closely with the Austrians, with the Russians, and the French, and learns their culture, um, it makes a lot of connections in these countries, and then uses, is eventually able to use these connections to both manipulate these people to strengthen Germany and then to convince them of the importance of peace once he unifies Germany. And so Bismarck is one of the most brilliant politicians in Prussia at the time when Wilhelm I really wants to pass his military budget. So he taps Bismarck and says, hey, can you talk to Congress? Unfortunately, for Bismarck, he also fails to pass the military budget before the German legislature. He gives a great speech, the blood and iron speech. He says, Germany's not going to be united by a bunch of liberal voting and equality and freedom and blah, 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 like, like you guys tried to do in 1848. Germany is going to be united by blood and iron, by an advanced industrialized military created by this doubling of, of, of uh, conscription and more professionalized training. Um, so despite the fact that he fails, he just sends out the tax collectors with the approval of Wilhelm I and he collects the taxes anyway. Um, and the legislature at this, at this point could have justifiably revolted against the leadership of Wilhelm I and Otto von Bismarck, but they don't. Um, and as they allow Bismarck to collect these taxes, Bismarck is very successful in building an excellent, professionalized, and big army. Okay, and so Bismarck is going to fight three wars to unify Germany. 
And in each of these wars, this is the strategy that he has, and it has three points. One, make sure you're stronger than your enemy, and this sounds like a no-brainer, but in the history of warfare, uh, many folks have launched wars when they actually were at a disadvantage militarily and believed things like, you know, the will of God or patriotism or nationalism or some, some other contributing factor would allow them to win, and oftentimes this goes badly. Bismarck also, using his diplomatic skills, isolates his enemies and so essentially what this means is he goes behind his enemies backs and makes sure that all the other countries around are either going to back up him or at least stay neutral and he does this at times by promising territory to countries for their neutrality and then if you can do it and he does this two out of three times you actually trick your enemy into declaring war right because People, generally speaking, don't sympathize with an aggressor. They don't sympathize with an attacker, but they do sympathize with a victim. And so if you can combine a military victory with a vision of victimization among the countries that surround you, you've won twice because not only can you get the territory you want, but the countries around you actually feel like you deserve it at the same time. So... What we're going to talk about now are the three wars that Bismarck fights to unify Germany. So, Bismarck's first war is the Danish War, and this is a war with Denmark, right? And essentially, you got Prussia here, you got Denmark here, and there's two provinces here there's Schleswig, and then there's Holstein, right? And you have another German province here, um, if you look at a map. Um, and uh, called Hanover, but that's not necessarily important for us now. What we want to focus on is Schleswig and Holstein, right? So Denmark decides to annex these two provinces. And annex just means sort of take over without a military fight. They already had treaties um, of one sort or another with Denmark, and Denmark essentially is going to just roll in and take them over and incorporate them into his country, like America did with Hawaii or China did with Tibet. Just take them over without a fight. Um, so Bismarck sees this as a great opportunity because Schleswig and Holstein, they have large German-speaking populations. And with large German-speaking populations, this annexation by Denmark can create a sense of nationalism which can unify the German people behind a Prussian attack on Denmark. Um, and there is an outrage throughout the German states about this attack or about this annexation and so Bismarck is able to go to war with much support from Prussia and the Prussians actually would like to fight this war alone without the help of other German states but Bismarck sees an opportunity here to draw the Austrians into an alliance which he could use in the future to to drive the Austrians out of a unified Germany and going back to that northern trade alliance um, you have this competition between Austria and Prussia for the unification of Germany, and Bismarck knows that it's Austria that's going to be the ultimate obstacle for Prussia leading a unified Germany. And so the long and short of it is, is the Prussians and the Austrians agree to attack Denmark together with a, as a German nationalistic alliance. Denmark is crushed very quickly because of the advanced weaponry of the Prussians, and then Bismarck gives the Austrians Holstein, right? And for them to govern. And what you want to notice about this is here's Prussia. Austria is way down here. And so for Austria to govern Holstein, they're much further away than, for example, the Prussians. And then this middle country in the middle, Hanover, becomes, as a result of winning this Danish war, becomes part of Prussia. So now Prussia is going to share a border with the Austrian province, the newly Austrian province of Holstein. And this is going to give Bismarck the, the situation that he needs to draw the Austrians into war. And these are just some pictures of the destruction in Denmark as a result uh, of the Danish war with Prussia and Austria. And just, you know, interestingly, this is a time where you see um, horse-mounted soldiers, and this is true all the way up until World War I, um, and you're also going to see the use of railroads. So you have this overlapping of steam technology and, and horse technology, if that's, what, if that's a term. And perhaps more importantly, you look at these cannons here, and like the breech-loading guns of the day, these are cannons that are breech-loading and they have rifled barrels. And what that means is, instead of loading them from the front, like a muzzle loader, right, 
or there's your muzzle, and you have to put your bullet in, you have to put your gunpowder in, and then you have to uh, put some paper in between them, and then you shoot them, and then you have to repeat the whole process. Every time you shoot the gun, it takes a really long time. Essentially, if you're a soldier with a muzzle-loading gun, and you're in any close proximity to the enemy, you have one shot, and then you try to club them to death with your rifle butt. Um, this new technology that Bismarck utilizes as much as he can, and has more of it than the other armies he's going to fight with, is a gun that loads from the back with a bullet that has the primer, the powder, and the bullet all in one. And so you load this from the back, you shoot, and then you just take another bullet, load it back in and shoot, and repeat, repeat, repeat. And so you can shoot at a much, much faster rate than you could with a muzzle loader. And because the barrels are rifled, and if you can still imagine that this, this terribly drawn rectangle or trapezoid here is a barrel, inside the barrel you have these circular grooves or spiral grooves going to the end. And this makes the bullet spin as it exits the barrel and makes it like a thousand times more accurate. Um, so with these two advances, breech loading and rifled barrels, the Prussian army um, is really unstoppable in the face of armies with lesser technology. So Denmark loses, Prussia dictates them a very easy peace. They just say, hey, we want these two provinces. Prussia gives one to Austria for, for their great nationalistic help. And we have the stage set for the next war. Okay, so the Austro-Prussian War. This is the war between Austria and Prussia that Bismarck has been planning for at least a little while. And he's trying to drive the Austrians out of a potentially unified Germany. And so first Bismarck goes behind the Austrians' back and makes sure the Russians, the Italians, and the French will be neutral. Italy at this point is also a collection of separate states like Germany. So when I say Italian, I mean one, one of these separate states. And what Bismarck does is he, he promises the French a little bit of land from Austria in the event of a war and a Prussian win, and the Italians a little bit of land in the event of a, a Prussian war with Austria and Prussia wins uh, to ensure that they will stay out of it, right? Um, Russia, uh, Russia is still bitter at Austria for not coming to their aid in the Crimean War when Britain and France united to crush Russia, or at least one Russian uh, naval base when the Russians were fighting against the Ottoman Empire, so the Russians are looking to get back at the Austrians at this point anyway. So, here's what happens. In Austria's province of Holstein, which you remember, shares a border with Prussia, Bismarck uses his agents to start some riots, break some windows, light some stuff on fire, right? Mad people in the streets. And then Bismarck cables the Austrians and he says, hey, Holstein, right? It's, uh, it's going crazy up there. You guys need to get up there and try to stop all this unrest. In fact, you guys probably can't get up there in time. And so we, your German brothers, the Prussians, would be happy to send our troops into Holstein to try to put down this unrest. The Austrians, of course, like most countries, aren't excited to have anybody else's army in their territory, and so they refuse this Prussian help, to which Bismarck replies that really it is a matter of Prussian national security, because this unrest is right on their border, to stop these riots, and they really can't do anything about it, they must go in, to which the Austrians reply that if Prussian troops enter Holstein, then Austria will declare war, which is exactly what Bismarck's plan has been all along. And so, Prussian troops go into Holstein, Austria declares war, Bismarck uses his advanced technology and more disciplined army to crush Austria in seven weeks. And this war is also called the Seven Weeks War. So it's not very long. Um, other interesting things that, that Bismarck uses, railroads. He has all his troops ready to jump on trains, which transport them much faster than horses and buggies, obviously. And the railroads go right into Austria. Um, and so really, this is Bismarck's plan to a T from the outset. The Austrians are crushed. And Bismarck then dictates them an easy peace, doesn't ask for a whole bunch of money from them, doesn't ask for a whole bunch of territory. He gives a little bit of their territory to the French, a little bit to the Italians, because previously they had agreed to be neutral behind the backs of the Austrians. And then Bismarck says to the Austrians, really what I want from you guys is to stay out of a potentially unified Germany, which is what he's been wanting all along. As a result of this, 
many German states join with the Prussians to create the beginnings of this unified Germany. There's a few in the south that haven't, and Bismarck believes that he needs to probably fight one more war to unite the states. This, these pictures, these are just, you know, some Prussians killing some Austrians, right? Battlefield, Prussians killing Austrians. What I really want to call your attention to is this. This is a board game for children that was created to, to, uh, to depict the Austro-Prussian War, the Seven Weeks War. And so your children, you take your nifty little game pieces and you roll the dice and you move through the beautiful Austrian countryside. There's lots of pretty colors right there, some victorious battles, and you quickly move more and more through the beautiful Austrian countryside until you get to Vienna, which is also beautiful, not destroyed at all, and there's lots of nationalistic ceremonies, and you win against the Austrians. And why I'm telling you about this is because this is what people believe war is about because of the easy victories of the Prussians and also simultaneously the easy victories of European powers against very less well-armed native populations in Africa and in India um, through imperialism. So what people believe in Europe is that if your army is technologically advanced, if you have modern breech-loading weaponry, and if you have a giant army that's well-trained, that all wars are going to be easy, quick, and victorious. What they don't take into account is what happens if your enemy also has a giant, well-equipped, and well-trained army. And these attitudes and the belief that war is awesome and glorious lead directly to World War I. Okay, so Bismarck believes that he needs one more big victory to unify those southern states in Germany and have his, have his unified German Empire. And fortunately for Bismarck, he realizes that the French, under the leadership of Napoleon III, would really like a war. And, and really, it's Napoleon III who wants the war, and he wants it because inside France, he's experiencing a fair amount of civil unrest. I mean, now Napoleon is also, or was also, a great practitioner of real politics, or the politics of reality. He rules through authoritarian nationalism, bringing back sort of the opulent court that was enjoyed by Napoleon I, and the opulence and that, you know, the, the greatness of this new emperor of France appeals to the conservative rural peasant population. And then Napoleon institutes a free trade agreement with the British, and he inspires industry, he creates a lot of public works, he rebuilds Paris, and so this appeals to the more liberal elements who want the business guys who want to make money. At the same time, Napoleon brutally oppresses any opposition to his rule, um, deporting thousands of French people to really harsh penal colonies outside the borders of France. And so eventually, these harsh policies, combined with a small economic recession, cause the French population to become rather restive. And Napoleon realizes that the best distraction for an angry internal population is an international war, a technique used by countries right up until today. Um, so, Napoleon wants a war, Bismarck knows he wants a war, and so Bismarck, all he has to do now is trick Napoleon into declaring war against Prussia, because Bismarck also knows that his, his, the French military is no match for the Prussian military. Many of the French fighters still use muzzle-loading weapons. Um, they haven't utilized the use of, of railways nearly to the extent that the Prussians have, etc., etc. So, this opportunity actually comes from a dispute in Spain, okay? So here's Spain, all right, you know, and here's the Pyrenees, here's France, right, and here's Prussia. In Spain, there is a military coup, right? The king is kicked off his throne, and the military wants a new king for Spain, right? They don't want to have a no king because it doesn't really appeal to the conservative element to the Spanish population. You want to have a king. And so the, the military in Spain, they're looking for a new royal family to rule over Spain. And they find a relative of the king of Prussia from the Hohenzollern branch, right? Long, noble name. You don't need to know how to spell it or anything. But essentially what you want to know is the Spanish 
are asking for a member of the Prussian royal family to rule over Spain. And this may sound good for Spain and for Prussia, but if you realize the link between these two potential royal families, you probably understand why the French have a huge problem with it because they are right in the middle of a potential pincer attack by these united noble families. So the French vociferously disagree with this selection, and eventually the Spanish just agreed not to have this relative of the Prussian royal family rule over Spain. But there is an incident um, at an embassy between an emissary of Napoleon III from France and William I of Prussia. And essentially, this emissary comes up to Wilhelm I of Prussia and he says, hey, look, we want you guys to promise never ever again, right, for as long as you live, to allow a member of your family to be the king of Spain or to be allowed to contest or to compete for the kingship of Spain. And William I says, yeah, great. I don't really have anything to do with, with this decision, but I can't agree to it nonetheless because you're asking me to agree to something forever and that's not really a good thing for a king to do. And this emissary from France sort of asks a couple of times fairly forcefully for Wilhelm to agree to never again let somebody from his family rule over Spain. And Wilhelm says pretty directly um, and forcefully, no, it's not going to happen. And then he says he doesn't want to see the emissary again. Well, Wilhelm writes up this conversation, or more accurately, he asks his secretary to write up the conversation, and then he sends the conversation to Otto von Bismarck, and he says, here is a conversation between myself and an emissary for Napoleon III. Publish it if you want to, and what I mean by that is send it to the international press if you want to. So Bismarck looks at the letter and he sees his golden opportunity. And he realized that already it's kind of a tense conversation. And if he can edit it out, if he can delete several of, of the instances that happened or parts of the conversation that happened, he can make it look like Wilhelm has sort of uh, given an intense insult to the French ambassador, therefore to Napoleon III, and therefore to all the people of France. So he does that. He edits, he edits this, makes it look really insulting to the French, he sends it to the international press. The press publish it. The French go bananas with nationalism and start chanting for war on the streets. And within six days, the French have pushed Napoleon III, who wanted the war anyway, into war with Prussia. And then once again, Bismarck is ready with his troops on, uh, on the railroads, jumping into the cars. They fly into France. And in a very short time, the French are defeated, including a capture of Napoleon III at the Battle of Sedan, where 100,000 troops and Napoleon are captured by the Prussians. It is a humiliating defeat for them. Okay, and then... To add humiliation to humiliation, Otto von Bismarck holds a crowning ceremony for King William or King Wilhelm, and they call him Kaiser William or Kaiser Wilhelm, which means Emperor of the Second German Empire, and they do this in the Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles, right? And so this is like in the, the building which the French people are most proud of, in the room they're most proud of, of the building they're most proud of, Versailles is like the symbol of French nationalism. And then you have the conquering army of the French crowning their emperor on the throne of the former French king. So this is just like a slap in the face, a kick in the teeth, throwing dirt in your mouth, rubbing some snow in your face with a whitewash, right? I mean, it just doesn't get any more humiliating than this. And so one thing to remember is that after this war, the French are desperate to get some revenge on the Prussians, which Bismarck knows. And so after winning this war with the French, the other southern German states join with Germany. You have a unified, very powerful German empire, which is Bismarck's life goal. And so then, like a pragmatist, he puts his ego right? Or maybe he's just too smart and he doesn't have anything to do with ego. But unlike Napoleon, unlike Hitler, Bismarck has accomplished his goals and he stops. He doesn't overextend himself and he spends his remaining years 
securing peace, peace treaties, an alliance with both the Russians and the Austrians. And this is very difficult because the Russians and the Austrians do not like each other at this point. But Bismarck secures peace. And because there's peace, because you got, you know, you got this unified Germany here, you got Russia here, you got Austria here, and then you got France all isolated over here. So essentially, as long as France does not have any allies in Russia or Austria, then they can only attack Germany on one border, and they are afraid to do that because of the power of the German military, and they will not do it. And this is what secures peace right up until Bismarck is fired, and France is then allowed to secure a, an alliance with the Russians, and it leads to World War I. But the long and short of it is Bismarck uses war when it's in the best interest of his country, and himself, and by best interest, you know, I just mean they were happy and nationalistic, not that, you know, warfare is a good thing for a country, but he makes Germany super powerful, they're united, that's what he wanted, and then he stops. And here's some propaganda, some French propaganda, here's poor little France, here's gigantic warmongering Germany, notice the fabulous facial hair depicted here as this Viking bears the hair um, of King Wilhelm I or Kaiser Wilhelm I, right? And then you notice the fist, the clenched fist of defiance of France. We are coming back to get you, right? And then over here, 1871, this is a hearse. Death is driving it and they are carrying France, right? So the day the French died, so to speak, or their country died. And then over here, you have Kaiser Wilhelm I, checking out his reflection in the mirror, right, admiring himself, and then you can see sort of this defeated Napoleon I being eclipsed by the shadow of the Kaiser. Then over here, you have Napoleon trying to put his son on the new throne of France after the war, and you can see it's not a very, not a very comfortable seat, right? And then Prussians destroying the French, Right, and then here is Paris, which was under siege for four months, uh, much of it totally destroyed by a bombardment from the Prussians. They were the last to surrender. And what we're going to get to is there is a, a revolt in a, a temporary socialist anarchist government that rules over Paris as they try to get some independence from France at the end of this war, and then they are brutally crushed and massacred um, by the French forces of the new government. And here's just some more pictures of a destroyed France. So, in summary, Bismarck uses the politics of reality, militarism, and nationalism and industrialization to arm Prussia and professionalize their army and then to deceive, to a certain extent, his opponents into war, which causes the nationalistic, nationalistic furor to spread through all the other German states, and they lovingly and devotedly join with Prussians, and Germany is united, and briefly, Europe is at peace. Um, as we head towards World War I. As we head towards World War I, all these other countries, the British, the French, the Russians, the Austrians, are going to build armies that are either a million strong or nearly a million strong. They're all going to have modern weaponry, except for the Russians, and they are going to be looking for an opportunity to fight a glorious war. And once Bismarck, the, the politician of peace at this point, is out of the picture, then Europe is rapidly um, going to spiral towards a catastrophic and inhumane war.